Today's reading is from Romans chapter 8 and it's verses 22 to 30. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. For who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Amen. So we're following through our series called Adventures in Prayer and we've looked already at keeping prayer simple, keeping it real and keeping going. And today we're going to think about something else. We're going to be thinking about how the Holy Spirit helps us when we pray. And uh, this is called Holy Groaning. I'm going to start with a bit of a story about myself. Um, when I was 21 years old, I just graduated from university and uh, I did a gap year, well, or about a year and a half in the end, um, with Wycliffe Bible Translators. And the format of the year was that you spent four months initially doing some training at their centre in the UK, and then you just got sent somewhere in the world for about a year or so to help Wycliffe with one of their Bible translation projects or one of their literacy projects on a short term basis. And I was really, really excited because I was going to be going to Papua New Guinea. Now, Papua New, New Guinea, to me, at the age of 21, sounded like a really, really exciting place. It was on the other side of the world. Um, it was a place with beautiful beaches, tropical rainforest, proper jungle. And um, I was going to be working with a particular small language group there. There's loads of languages spoken in Papua New Guinea. And I was going to be uh, living in a beautiful sounding place called Alatau on the coast of Papua New Guinea. And it just looked beautiful. And I was really excited about going there. So I did my training. I raised all the money to be able to go. I had my injections. I went through the process of applying for a visa. And uh, I was in, in touch with um, a couple who were working with Wycliffe over there. And I was going to be staying with them and... Um, helping them and so all the preparations were in place and I waited for this visa to turn up and it just didn't and I waited and I waited and I waited and the training had long since finished the other young people that I'd been doing my training with had all gone off to their placements um, John, who is now my husband, um, I met him on the training course. He went off to West Africa for his placement. Another friend, Becky, went off to Cameroon. Somebody else went to the Congo. But my visa for Papua New Guinea still had not arrived. And uh, I was just waiting. I was back at home with my parents by now. I ended up getting a part-time job because I just needed something to do. And I didn't know how long this was all going to take. And of course, as you do at such times, I was praying. I was praying and praying and praying and praying, probably harder than I'd ever prayed for anything before. I was praying for that visa to come through. And my family was praying, my friends were praying, my whole church was praying. And I seem to remember that 
this was uh, one of the first times really in my life where things hadn't kind of gone smoothly and I started to feel quite low. I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't understand why, when I was so keen to serve God, that he wouldn't just make everything happen for me. I didn't understand why he was making me wait. I didn't understand why he wasn't answering my prayers. It seems a bit silly now, looking back on it, because it was only a, a short time really in my life. And compared to the the huge suffering that so many people go through on a day-to-day -day basis, it was nothing. But at the age of 21, it seemed like a huge thing to me. It felt like my life had just come grinding to a big halt. And I really was groaning. I remember reading the verse from Habakkuk, which says this, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the sheepfold and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. And I remember reading that verse probably for the first ever time and kind of praying it through gritted teeth and saying, I will try really hard to rejoice, but I'm really cross with you, God. But as I look back, I see that actually part of what was happening was I really didn't know what I ought to pray for. And that's partly what this passage I've read in Romans is about. I didn't know what I ought to pray for. I don't know whether you sometimes look back at times in your own life and see times where you prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for something. And now looking back, you see that if you'd actually got what you prayed for, it wouldn't have been good for you. In fact, maybe it would have even been disastrous. And we so often pray for something that we think is right at the time. And quite often it's for quite selfish things, really, for our own comfort, for healing, for God to just kind of rubber stamp our plans, for the, the way to be made smooth for us. Whereas actually the reality is that God has something quite different planned for us. And uh, as verse 29 in our passage from Romans says, God has predestined us to be conformed into the image of his son. So his plan for us, his will for us, is actually holiness. It's Christ-likeness. It's to make us more like Jesus. And actually, often, that doesn't necessarily mean the easiest path. It's often that narrow, difficult path, entering through the narrow gate, as Jesus said. And of course, looking back now, God, of course, had a different plan for me than going to Papua New Guinea. I've never been to Papua New Guinea. The visa never came. And um, what happened was I ended up going to Senegal to the same place where John was. And by the end of that year, uh, we got engaged. Within three years, we were living in North Wales and the rest is history. It does sound a bit like a fairy tale. And I do thank God so much for that. But it kind of masks the truth, really, which is that that year for me in Senegal was not really that easy. It was actually one of the most challenging years that I've ever had in my life. I was homesick. I got quite depressed at times. I found communication difficult. Um, I got, got culture shock. I struggled to adapt to being in such a completely different culture and I made some big mistakes. But also I was challenged there. I was challenged to a new level of faith, a new level of dependence and trust in God than I'd ever had before. A few weeks ago, um, when we talked about keeping prayer simple, we read that verse in Matthew that says, your father in heaven knows what you need before you ask him. And in all my groaning and praying, God knew that what I needed actually was not for that visa to be magically granted and for everything to suddenly be all right. God wanted to work in my life in a deeper way. He wanted to conform me more into the likeness of his son, Jesus. God was working things together for my good, even though it didn't look that way at the time. So I didn't know what I ought to pray for. And so often we don't know 
what we ought to pray for. We can't see the future. Verse 26, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit helps us in our weakness, interceding for us by wordless groans. The Baptist preacher David Coffey says this, I quite like this, he says, there are moans and groans in the Christian life. Moaning is futile, but the right kind of groaning can be filled with hope. Let me read that again. There are moans and groans in the Christian life. Moaning is futile, but the right kind of groaning can be filled with hope. I wonder, what kind of holy groaning have you been doing recently? Someone said to me earlier this week that the world that we're living in at the moment feels quite horrible. And I think that's true. The whole creation is groaning, as it says in Romans 8.22. Creation is groaning. Groaning under the weight of the continuing pandemic. Groaning with extreme weather events, many of which, of course, are exacerbated by climate change. Groaning with the weight of the threat of war. We think about what's happening on the borders of Ukraine. Groaning in our own country as the cost of living spirals groaning with the sheer weight of human suffering. We've got refugees, people ground down with poverty, with abuse, by terror, by violence. The list goes on. Maybe we're groaning too on an individual level, groaning in physical pain or emotional pain, groaning with anxiety or having to deal with highly stressful situations, whether that be in our families or at work just groaning with a desire for things to be better, for things to be right. We know that things are not right. They don't feel right. The world is fallen. The world is aching. Creation is groaning. We sort of understand this intuitively because we feel it, don't we? There is a difference, as David Coffey says, between moaning and holy groaning. Moaning is when we complain, when we get bitter, when we resent God, when we blame other people, moaning is when we whine and whinge and things become hopeless. But there is a place for a holy groaning when we cry out to God in prayer. It says in verse 23, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. This kind of groaning is not a hopeless groan. And Paul compares this kind of groaning to groaning as in the pain of childbirth. Well, when I was in labour with both my children, um, I certainly did a lot of groaning and especially with Beth on the first one, because she took rather a long time to arrive and it was not much fun. I did a lot of groaning, but that groaning was not a meaningless or a purposeless groaning. Because in the middle of it, in the middle of the intense pain, in the middle of the mess, in the middle of the waiting and the agony, something new, something new was being birthed. There was new life coming into the world. There was something miraculous happening, something beautiful being born, a new creation. And I think prayer is like that. Prayer gives us hope. Hope that God is at work and that God is in the business of liberating creation and bringing it into the glory and freedom of God, as it says in Romans 8.21. Gives us a hope that God is at work within us, redeeming our bodies, conforming us into the likeness of his son, Jesus. It gives us hope that God is at work in all things for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the first fruits of this. First fruits is a great image. It's a great metaphor because it's like the first apples that come on the tree, the first blackberries that start popping up in August. They give us a taste, they give us a flavour of the abundance that is to come. And the Holy Spirit is like that. The Holy Spirit is God's presence dwelling in us now, 
giving us a taste of what it will be like when God finally comes to dwell with his people forever. And it says there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain because the presence of God will bring justice and peace and boundless love and joy. And in that context, these verses from Romans are so, so encouraging when we think about our prayer lives. Verses 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Holy Spirit, remember, is not like a cartoon ghost or some kind of vague force like in Star Wars. The Holy Spirit is a person, one of the three persons of the Trinity, one of the three persons of God. The Holy Spirit is God's very presence living within us as Christians. So what Paul is saying here is amazing because he's saying that the the Spirit is praying for us. I find that amazing. The Spirit is interceding and praying for us. Some people think that Paul is also talking about praying in tongues here. And certainly praying in tongues is something that's really helped me when I'm in a situation where I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray for a particular person or a particular situation. And tongues are not a magic or scary thing. It's just opening our mouths and praying words that we don't understand, but allowing the Holy Spirit to pray in and through us. But actually, I feel like it's more than that in these verses. I'm sure that actually all of us, whether we pray in tongues or not, all of us can probably identify with Paul of having those days when all that we can do is groan. Maybe when we're in such physical or emotional pain that we just can't think straight and we just go, oh God. Maybe those days when we watch the news and we're just so overwhelmed by the suffering in the world that we just don't know how to pray and we long for justice and we long for change and we long for things to be better and we just say, oh God. Maybe when we're facing a decision, a dilemma or a really difficult situation, so complicated or difficult that we feel completely inadequate to deal with it. And we just say, oh God. Or maybe those times when God puts in our hearts a sadness for those people that don't yet know him and a longing, a real longing that they will turn back to him And we just say, oh God. Sometimes all we can do is groan. And in those situations, Paul says, the Holy Spirit is groaning along with us. This is the pattern, isn't it, of how God works. God with us. Jesus sharing our humanity when he comes to earth as a human. God with us. Jesus suffering with us on the cross, experiencing the weight of our sin, our guilt, our shame, our separation from God. God with us in Jesus. And now this, the Holy Spirit, praying with us, groaning with us, praying for us. God with us. So God says to us today, bring me your holy groans. Bring me your sighing and your crying and your sense of injustice and your sense that the world is just not fair. Bring me, he says, your wordless pain when you wake up in the middle of the night and just don't know what to do. Bring it all to me and the Holy Spirit will translate it into something that conforms to God's will, into something that beats to God's heartbeat, into something that participates in God's plan. Because I think that when I was praying to go to Papua New Guinea, God still heard my prayers, even though they were for the wrong thing and they were completely misplaced. God heard the cry of my heart that actually what I wanted was to serve him and what I wanted was to follow him. And so in the middle 
of this holy groaning in the middle of the pain and the mess and the waiting. Something new is being birthed, new life, something miraculous, something beautiful, a new creation. And that is prayer. Who knows what God might bring to birth when we turn to him and pray. Amen. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, sometimes all we can do is turn to you and groan. And we can't get the words out. Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit who's alive and living within us. And I thank you for that, that help that he gives us when we pray. I thank you that you know us. I thank you that you have called us. And I thank you that you are working things together for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen.